Now let's look at a couple more biblical texts and examples. Well, the Gospels, you might say, well, we don't really have church planting in the Gospels because the church wasn't really born until Pentecost after Christ died and was resurrected and ascended. But what we do have is, is Jesus building a community, his community of the 12 disciples, the larger community of, of the 70. Jesus training the disciples in, in how to do ministry, how to minister to people, how to preach, how to heal, how to cast out demons. And so what we have is sort of the, the seminal, the, the seed of the life of the church in the life of the disciples and Jesus living with them. We have the foundations of the teachings of the kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, in the many parables of the kingdom. And so we have, as it were, the pregnant, that the church is sort of pregnant in the original disciples. And then, of course, at Pentecost, the church is actually born and comes into being. In Acts, of course, as I mentioned, the church is now born, the church comes into being, and so we have the realization. Jesus had said, the kingdom, the end will not come until what? Until the gospel of the kingdom is preached among all nations. And so the book of Acts, the church is born. Now it's no longer on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Now the church is, becomes the mobile temple. Now the church is the new people of God. And the book of Acts shows it moving out. And, and so we have, you know, from Jerusalem and then to Judea and Samaria and then to the Greek and the Roman world and ultimately to the ends of the earth. And that is the realization of the mission of God in the New Testament. And we see churches being planted everywhere. We'll look at more passages from Acts in a moment. And then in the epistles, the letters that Paul wrote, we need to think about these as being really missionary, missionary letters. See, who were those letters written to? You say, well, the church in Ephesus or the church in Colossae, the church in Philippi. Those were church plants. They were young churches. The epistles of Paul are missionary letters written to church plants. And so what these letters really are is they're instructions to new Christians living in new churches. Now, most of us, we've been reading these letters and we say, well, the church has existed for centuries and you know our church has existed for maybe 50 years or 100 years and, and we just sort of read them into our own context. But they were originally written to church plants. And so they're really missionary letters. They're like the letter of the missionary to that church that he planted and now he's left. They're letters to churches that are wrestling with what does it mean to be a Christian because most of them, except maybe the book of Hebrews, they're written to Gentile believers. They didn't grow up with the rich tradition of Israel. They didn't grow up with the law of Moses. They didn't grow up with, with a moral upbringing according to God's plan. They grew up in a pagan world. And so now they're trying to wrestle, what does it mean to live now as a Christian as a pagan, in a pagan world, in a pagan environment? And so these letters, the epistles are instructing these churches, what does that mean? Because it looks different than it does for the Jews still in Jerusalem. Those Christians in Jerusalem, they're still going and they're worshiping in the temple. Remember at the end of the book of Acts, Paul goes back to Jerusalem and they say, Paul, you need to go to the temple, you need to, to perform a vow. They're still zealous for the law back there. Very different world. And so these epistles are helping these churches, these new believers, find out what does it mean to be God's people? What does it mean to live a holy life? And so the epistles are giving depth, deepening the life of these new church plants. And so really, in fact, one German New Testament scholar, Hengel, has said, that all these books, all the literature of the New Testament is really missionary literature. They're born in the mission of the church. Let's look for a moment at Paul's practice of church planting. Well, of course, we have the report in the book of Acts, which is a chronological uh, story of, of how he went from place to place. 
and we can discover many things that Paul generally moved on after a relatively short time. Sometimes he was run out of town. He was beaten up or thrown in prison and run out of town. But when he got to a place like Ephesus where God had opened up opportunities, he stayed longer. And so uh, some of the features we find in Paul's mission, we may ask, do we need to do everything the way Paul did it? And I'll come back to that question in a moment. But certainly Paul's mission was born in evangelism. It was born in evangelism. It was through the preaching of the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit as people heard that message, as the Spirit moved in their lives, as they responded to it, those people were brought together. And then it was a process of helping them live out that discipleship. And then after Paul left the churches, he didn't abandon the churches. He left. There were local leaders in those churches who were given responsibility for the spiritual care. Think of the speech at the, uh, in, in Ephesus in, in uh, Acts chapter 20 where he gives a charge to those young believers, the church was only a couple years old, to those believers, the, the elders of the church, to look after the flock. There's going to be sheep and, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing that come later, false teachers. But he leaves the church in their care. He's raised up leaders there that will now care for that church in the ongoing ministry, and then he moves on. He writes some letters. He sends under wor other workers. But ultimately, the church is completed when those leaders are installed. And in fact, he writes Titus in the book of Titus to complete what was unfinished in the church in Crete. What was unfinished? The appointing of elders in those churches. So Paul's work as a pioneer is considered completed when those local leaders are in place. Now, so the recruitment of workers was a key to Paul's ministry in many ways, not only for the local church, that it would be strong, but also for the larger mission. Now, here's something really fascinating, uh, is to look at um, church multiplication in Paul's ministry. Sometimes people say, well, isn't it good enough to just plant one church? Well, Paul became a person who planted churches that reproduced. Remember, he said his work all the way from Jerusalem to Illyricum was finished? That's because the churches he planted were reproducing churches. If we look, for example, at the church in Pisidian Antioch, and we read there in Acts chapter 13, verse 49, it says, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Now, does that mean Paul went through the whole region? No. The local believers were spreading the message of Jesus. It was, it was natural. It was spontaneous. They, they had Jesus in their hearts, and it was natural for them to spread out that message in the entire region. 1 Thessalonians 1.8, Paul writes, The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we don't need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us, and so on. And so we see that the Thessalonians, their conversion was so dramatic, as Paul says, the way they turned uh, for, to God from idols to serve the living and true God, that was so dramatic that the message was spreading out in the whole region and beyond. And so we see, again, a spontaneous spread now, we might ask, did that actually result in churches? And I think that one of the clearest examples that, in fact, this sort of spontaneous spread of the gospel that was happening through these new believers was not uh, something random, but it actually resulted in churches. And if we look at what happened in Ephesus, 1 Corinthians 16.9. In 1 Corinthians 16.9, Paul tells the Corinthians that he's going to delay coming to them because he says, um, because a great, he says, I will stay, verse 8, I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work is open to me and there are many who oppose me. So by the way, a great door, open door for effective work may also have opposition. Opposition does mean a closed door. In fact, where there's an open door, there may very well be spiritual opposition. But he says, I'm going to stay longer in Ephesus. 
He saw such an opportunity there, he's going to delay going to Corinth, even though the church there needed help. Well, we see what happened in Acts chapter 19 of his ministry in Ephesus and just how God had opened a door. If we read in verse 10, for example, uh, they were preaching and people were, were coming to Christ. Uh, he, it says he was taking disciples with him and having discussions daily in the hall of Tyrannus. It says verse 10, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. In other words, through his teaching, people were telling others. And so through the entire province, he's saying virtually everybody heard the message. And then later in verse 20, in verse 20, he writes that in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So the word of the Lord is spreading throughout the province of Asia, which today would be Western Turkey. Now, do we know that churches came to be out of that? Absolutely. You know of the so-called seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. So Ephesus is the church, the first church that was established here. And that's where Paul said, I'm going to stay longer because there's an open door. And so these other churches in the region were established. Here you can sort of take the road around to all these different cities, but that's not all. We know also there was a church in Colossae and there was a church in Hierapolis. Now who started all those churches? Not Paul. Not Paul. In fact, when Paul writes to believers in Colossae, he says, I've never met you. He did not plant the church in Colossae. And he probably didn't plant any of the other ones either. But he launched a movement in Ephesus that radiated out, not only in evangelism, but in establishing churches in all these different communities. There may have been more. These are just the ones that we know of by name. I believe that's what he meant when he talked about the whole region hearing the message and having a wide door of opportunity. And so that's why when we plant churches, we want to plant churches that are reproducing because that's how we're going to reach a whole community. That's how we're going to reach a whole city. That's how we're going to reach a whole nation is when the churches we plant are not a dead end, but they in turn reach other people and plant new churches. So we'll take a pause there and I want to continue on with Pauline practice. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com.